Good morning, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I am very grateful for a day like St. Patrick's Day. It uh, affords me the opportunity to pull out the only green thing in my wardrobe and know exactly that it's fitting to wear that day. So uh, most of us, or at least I don't often give that much consideration to my wardrobe, but at least I know that I'm on target today. So. Um, <laughs> Amen that I don't often give Thanks. consideration to my warner. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please open up your Bible and turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel 13. We're going to continue in our study in the book of Samuel uh, in a series that we call, or we have been calling, The King is Coming. Um, throughout this historical narrative of the nation of Israel... Uh, we've seen how the people of God rejected him as their authority and wanted a king like all the other nations. Uh, so God allowed them to have a king. Their first king, Saul, had some external credentials. Uh, he was responsible. He was reliable. He was tall and handsome. But his character left much to be desired. And when Saul showed his true colors, lack of faith in the Lord, God had David anointed who would take over the kingdom. And twice the author in 1 Samuel calls David a man after God's own heart. And we see David as a man of faith and courage and humility, uh, even as Saul is chasing him around the country trying to kill him. And we see it in the way that he uh, conducts his life. And in the things that he pursues. Yet David wasn't perfect. Nevertheless, God promised David that he would establish his kingdom forever. And it's not so much that David was the best man available. Clearly he wasn't. But it's by God's grace that God chose David and his family, warts and all. And as we saw last week, and we studied uh, about David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah in an attempt to cover up his sin, David's warts started to look more like gangrene. And so that should leave us as the readers, the studying people of this passage, to think if David's not the man for the job, I sure hope that someone better is coming. Well, spoiler alert, the king is coming. Unfortunately for David and his family, things will go from bad to worse, which is what we're going to look at today. But God is faithful to his word, because it's not really about David. I mean, the stories are, but ultimately it's not really about David. The holy and righteous king is coming. So please pray with me once again before we uh, look at today's passage. Father, we are told that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That it helps us to discern our, our intentions and our heart. We're also told that your word um, can be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And because of that, God, we want to look at your word and see what you have to say for us to light our path. To help us to discern what is going on in our hearts. And ultimately, for us to turn from those ways that we are prone to living. Uh, and to fall more in love with you. And to become more like Jesus. And so God, I pray that you'll do that in us today. As we look at this. This difficult passage to read as we look at this 
this episode in the life of David and his family. And may my words be your words. So make us like Jesus, we pray. And it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned last week, uh, we studied the story of David and Bathsheba. And that story gives us a little bit of context for today. If you recall, the prophet Nathan confronted David with his sin using a parable about a rich man with many sheep who stole the lone, dearly loved sheep of a poor man. And David's response to hearing this parable is found in chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, where it said, David burned with anger against the man, and he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And as we know, Nathan turned to David and said, you are that man. Your sin with Bathsheba is like that of stealing the sheep from this poor man. And so David then, in in his response, was declaring judgment upon himself, death, and fourfold retribution. But Nathan continued, and he said this as part of his of God's judgment on David. That from this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. And this is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. In that last verse, we saw that David clearly confessed his sin. And if you read Psalm 51, you certainly know that his confession was genuine. And he was broken over his sin. And we see, too, that God forgave him. And he showed mercy to him by allowing him to live when death really would have been a very fitting punishment. Yet, as those previous verses indicated, there were going to be severe consequences to David and his family because of the sin. Punishment for showing contempt to the word of the Lord was certainly in order. Now, on this side of the cross, as, as believers, sometimes we have a hard time with that concept. I think we often go to 1 John 1, 9, where we, we think about where it says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we think, I get it, I've done wrong. I confess it before the Lord, he's forgiven me. And maybe God should just leave me alone, right? I shouldn't have to deal with consequences. I I owned up to my sin. I know sometimes I can be that way. I'm like... I've owned up to it, and I really hope that God doesn't deal with me the way that my sin deserves. But that's not really a biblical concept. In fact, confession and forgiveness notwithstanding, there are consequences to our sin. And if you have the notes from our, uh, in your bulletin, Uh, There are some of those blanks that you can fill in. But even when there is confession and forgiveness, there are still some consequences that that come with it. I just yesterday heard somebody use this analogy that 
You can throw a stone into a stream. You can go and pull that stone out of the stream. That's forgiveness. Nevertheless, there will be ripples that are caused by that stone. And that's just the consequence. Yeah, God forgives us. But there are always going to be consequences that are the natural implications resulting from our sin. And there may be punishments that go along with it. The book of Proverbs and Hebrews and, and actually others as well talk about how the Lord disciplines those that he loves. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. The Apostle Paul takes this concept just a little bit further uh, when he's writing to the church uh, in Galatia where he says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. We will reap what we sow. And so all this gives us a little bit of context for what we're going to read here in 2 Samuel 13. So again, if you have your Bibles, please open it up and follow along with me. Um, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV. And I'm just going to start with reading the first 22 verses. So it's a long section. So, um, But it says, In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shemiah, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do, do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with, my sister, with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and prepared to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat it from her hand. David sent word to Tamar in the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said to her, Come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said to him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep you from, marrying, from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with an intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of here and bolt the door after her. 
So a servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. And when King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. We'll stop there for now. Clearly, that's a difficult passage to read. This is following again right off the heels of David's sin. And the author here isn't trying to be salacious. He's not trying to tell you a story that you sit and you, you dwell on the story itself like you might watch in, in a movie. But he's trying to make the connection between David's sin and the consequences of that sin. And while doing so, he's clearly showing the nature and the impact of sin. And so I just want to look at a couple of those things as we both look at the characters that are in this story, as well as the different ways uh, that it plays out and the destructiveness of it. And so the first thing I want to point out is just the perverse nature of sin. And certainly you can see that, and, but it's not just in a, in a sexual way that it's perverse. It's just perverse in how it, it distorts the way things are. Nature, uh, sin distorts the way that things really should be. And the first aspect of the, this perverse nature we see in the character of Amnon and his unbridled lust. See, Amnon was David's oldest son. And he's an example of the apple not falling very far from the tree. The text says that he was in love with his half-sister. Maybe it started out as love, but it's certainly not the kind of love that you would read about in 1 Corinthians 13. It's not patient or kind or self-seeking or not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. No example of this being protecting or trusting or, or hoping or persevering. His love really surfaced as unbridled lust. See, when he realizes that he can't do anything to her, which even that terminology tells me that his intentions weren't loving intentions. But he can't do anything about these feelings that have been welling up. He's, he's been obsessed with his sister. He can't do anything about it. Maybe because they live in another part of the palace. Or maybe because of her age. Or maybe because he knew that incestuous relationships like this was strictly forbidden by God's law. But either way, like his father David, he sees a beautiful woman... And he goes after and gets what he wants. He thinks that his actions are, are justified because of his obsessive feelings. But then when he gets what he wants, Amnon just tosses her aside. He hates her. He violates her by force and then he despises her for it. I, I don't really understand all the, psycho the psychology behind this. But it's clearly recorded and, and demonstrated that this is a typical behavior of a rapist to blame the victim. You know, to hate them for not loving them in return. Or to direct a self-hatred because of what they just did, knowing it was evil, but then directing that toward the victim. 
rather than really owning it for them, the crime that it is. Either way, he hates her and he kicks her out. Tells her to get up, get out. You know, our, our English versions in verse 17 says that he told his servants to get this woman out. And in the original Hebrew, the word woman isn't there. He doesn't see her as a person anymore. He just tells the servant, get this out of here. There is something deeply disturbing and perverse about sin. And how it leads us to treat other people. And certainly in Amnon's case, there's an unbridled lust uh, that it's clear to see the perversity in it. But then there's a second character in this story, Jonadab, Amnon's friend, his cousin. He was a nephew of King David. And he's the one who came up with the plan to put Amnon into a position to finally do something to his sister, Tamar. As much as I don't like Amnon in this story, I really don't like Jonadab too. Because he's the one who came up with this diabolical plan to do evil. Some of our translations call him wise. The NIV, as we read, called him shrewd. He's the kind of man who uses the wisdom of the world for evil purposes. Like a typical Washington politician, maybe. I don't know. He's the kind of man described in Jeremiah 4.22 that is skilled at doing evil. Though he didn't commit the evil deed, he's just as guilty. He says he's a friend, but this isn't the kind of friend you want. He doesn't confront Amnon or hold him accountable by saying, no, this is wrong. Nor does he even suggest something noble, helping him come up a way with maybe he could just spend time in a virtuous way with his sister. Instead, Jonadab comes up with an underhanded scheme that helps Amnon get the object of his desire. And he does it in a way that makes David complicit in the act. That's shrewd, right? Maybe as the son of David's older brother, he thinks that his family should be the ones on the throne. And that maybe this is a way to manipulate the downfall of the house of David. Or maybe he's just a punk. But again, it's easy to see how perverse sin is when you see Jonadab and Amnon scheming together to do something that is so despicable. That's definitely not the kind of friends that we want. Of course, there's a third person in this story. Tamar. She's the victim. And certainly our hearts go out to her because she so clearly is the victim in this. Now, if I may, at the risk of sounding a, <clears throat> a bit callous, we need to remember that this passage isn't really about her. And it's not really a passage about the evils of incest and rape. That, that is the example that is being used to point out the heinous, destructive nature of sin. But it's not really a, a, a morality lesson about don't do this. Although, don't do this, right? It should be obvious. But we see the per perverse nature of sin so clearly because she is the innocent victim. I mean, she obeyed her father and went to her brother as he told her to. She made food as she was asked. She served her brother, believing that he was truly ill. 
but she was the unheard victim in this. When Amnon forced himself on her, she protested on a four different levels. Don't force me. Rape is wrong. This shouldn't be done in Israel. God's law pro prohibits rape and incest. And then she says, what about my reputation? Do you really love me if you don't care about my reputation? And then she appeals to him in a fourth way. What about you? You're the crown prince. How will this affect your future? I think she even tries to buy time in there, suggesting that they go talk to David. Maybe dad will, can do something about this. Maybe he will allow us to get married. Now, certainly I doubt that she wanted that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nor do I really think that David would have allowed that, knowing that that was against God's law. But maybe she could escape that current situation if in his warp thinking, Amnon would say, yeah, well, maybe let's go talk to David about it and maybe he'll let us do it. But certainly he wasn't that reasonable, and he forced her anyway. He refused to listen to her, and he forced himself upon her. Then as he's kicking her out, she appeals to him again. You know, the law said that, that, I, that he, at this point, should take on responsibility to care for her and provide for her. But instead, he tossed her aside. And that was what was the greater sin. Is that rather than taking responsibility, he left her to be a desolate woman. Being left shamed and desolate was worse than the rape. Because the physical wounds would heal, but she would carry the disgrace of it the rest of her life. But then again, she was ignored. She was unheard. Now, it seems a little odd to me, too, that despite the fact that she goes away publicly mourning in ashes and a torn robe, she's unheard of as well by her father. The text doesn't say that he said anything to her or did anything to comfort her. And so in that regard, she's unheard again. There is something perverse about sin that leads us to respond sometimes the way that we do. And there's one more uh, character to, to bring about in this section, and that's Absalom, Tamar's full brother. And we see the perverse nature of sin in, in his unhurried revenge. Now, Absalom does the right thing in, by taking his sister to live with him. His response to her might seem a little callous. Be quiet. He's your brother. Don't take this to heart. But I don't think that that's how we should read that. I don't think that's what he means. He's not saying that in a callous way. I don't think he's trying to say, you know, just get over it in, in, in minimizing her pain. What he's saying to her is, don't worry. He's your brother. He's not going anywhere. And I'm going to take care of it. You don't need to worry about it because I'm going to take care of it. And it's that, that moment that he starts plotting his revenge. Well, for sake of time, I'm actually not going to read the rest of the chapter. But verses 23 through 39 tell how Absalom, two years after the event, takes out his revenge on his brother. Two years. That's two years of thinking, of Amnon thinking that he got away with it. 
That's two years of Tamar living in disgrace. That's two years of Absalom himself brooding with hatred and plotting his revenge. It really is, it's, it's a very intriguing story how, how in this event of shearing the sheep, Absalom invites all of his brothers to participate in it. He goes and invites David to be a part of it, and David says no. And then, so Absalom suggests that Amnon come in his stead. And David seems really, like, curious why he would do that, you know. But it's in that instant, during the shearing of the sheep, that Amnon has his servant kill him, kill Amnon. So similar to Amnon's scheme to get Tamar, Absalom comes up with a scheme to make David complicit in the action. He gets David to send Amnon. And Absalom... Like his sin with, Bash, with like David and his sin with Bathsheba, gets his servants to do the dirty work. He waits for Amnon to get drunk, like David tried to do with Uriah. And that's when he wants his servants to kill Amnon. It's funny to me how as he's trying to tell his servants to do this deed. He dresses it up with words of virtue. He said, don't be afraid. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and brave. I mean, he's sounding a little bit like Joshua in there, that this is a good, virtuous thing. But there's a perversity there when sin is allowed to sit in a person's heart and fester and plot out another person's demise. There's a perversity there when because of your sin, you can dress it up in your own way of thinking to say that there's something good and right about it. And so then to even encourage others to participate it, in it. He was unhurried in his revenge and it took him two years to take out that plot. Well, those are four characteristics that we saw in the perverse nature of sin. But there is one more character, and that's David himself. And in David, we see the paralyzing impact of sin. The text says that when David heard about Amnar's rape, he was furious, he was angry. It doesn't say necessarily why he was angry. Was it because of how appalling Amnon's actions were? Was it because he was, Amnon was the crown prince and that this could ruin everything for him and, and, and the kingdom as a whole? Or was he angry because of Tamar and that he cared for her and he was upset about that? Was he angry because Jonadab made him complicit in the scheme? And that he didn't like being made a fool of? We don't necessarily know. But he was furious. But that's it. There's no record of him taking action in any way. And so that's one of the paralyzing things with sin is that it made David unable, or maybe even unwilling, to do the right thing. His anger should have led him to justice. He should have punished Amnon quickly and severely, but he didn't. He should have consoled and exonerated Tamar, but he didn't. He should have confronted Absalom. He had two years to do that. Could have confronted that son while he was brooding, but he didn't. He was unable or unwilling to do what was right. 
And certainly David, as we could probably all relate to in some way, was living in the shadow of his own guilt. And it seems like his own sin might have been what was preventing him from confronting sin in others. But here's David. The the young shepherd boy who once saw the evil of Goliath and defying the armies of the living God, and he took action. This is the same David who was a warrior who took action against the enemy nations that were surrounding Israel. This was even the same David who just in the couple previous chapters, when hearing Nathan's parable about the stolen lamb, jumped at wanting to get justice for that poor man. Not, re- not realizing he was condemning himself. Yet now, having been confronted with his sin, he was paralyzed by inaction. And he was negligent as a king and a father. As one author put it, because of David's silence, Amnon remained an unpunished felon. Tamar languished as damaged goods. And Absalom became a seething vigilante. Sin will paralyze us from doing what is right. But then there's a second thing with David, is that it seems to me that because of his sin, he became completely unaware of his surroundings. And because he was unaware, that he seemed like he was easily manipulated by his kids. He didn't really have a clue what was going on in his own household. He was present, but it seems like he was a bit checked out. What if David had noticed Amnon's demeanor before Jonadab did? Could he have talked some sense into him, preventing the rape? What if he had been aware, or maybe he was aware and just didn't care, but maybe what if he had been aware that Absalom hadn't been talking to Amnon for two years. And you would think, that's a pretty obvious thing. Could he have brokered a peace between the brothers and prevented Amnon's murder? He clearly didn't seem aware that Absalom had it out for Amnon. In in verse 32, after the scheme is carried out, And and David thinks that, as he was told, that all of his sons had been killed. Jonadab tells him that it was Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister. It was Absalom's intention to kill Amnon. David should have been aware of that before he sent his son to the sheep shearing party. Sin and the guilt that follows it can paralyze us. It can make you pull into your own shell and cut yourself off from the rest of the world. You don't want to be seen. You don't want to be judged. You don't care what others are doing or think. Your focus is only on yourself. There's one more thing. And David, it seems that there was just some unfitting emotions. Now, I don't know, unfitting, misguided might be a better word, but I really wanted a U word that started with you there. So, um, and I'll, I'll be honest too, that maybe this one might be a bit of a stretch from the text itself, but I think it's there both in the text and even in our own life experience. As we already mentioned, David was furious at the news of the rape, but he did nothing. Certainly anger and fury were appropriate, but they were without action. So that anger was meaningless. 
it wasn't directed at anything appropriate. At the same time, when his daughter was shamed, he didn't go and confront her. He was angry probably toward his favorite son, the crown prince. But then he lacked the compassion for his daughter. Later in the chapter, again, as I just referenced, upon hearing the the fake news that all of his sons had been killed, he immediately tore his clothes and lay on the ground in mourning. This probably would have been appropriate if it were true, but he didn't even bother to inquire about the details, which, if you look back at 2 Samuel chapter 1, is something he did when he heard about the death of Saul. He went and got all the information before he responded. But here David, in his emotions, just responds without being responding to what was really true. And then lastly, after Absalom killed Amnon, and he fled, and Absalom fled to his grandfather's kingdom where he lived for three years, verse 39 says that David longed to go to Absalom. Now, admittedly, that's a verse that's a little unclear or hard to understand. You know, did he long for him because he wanted to reconcile with Absalom? Or did he long for him because he wanted to get justice because Absalom had killed Amnon? I kind of lean toward that second one. But either way, it seems that David had a hard time reacting in a way that was really appropriate for the situation. And that's the same with us, right? We are paralyzed by our sin. We have a hard time controlling our emotions. Sometimes we either react or overreact or we don't react. Sometimes we ignore justice or we long for justice. And we demand it in ways that might be inappropriate. But all of that is what sin does, is it paralyzes us. And David was reaping what he sowed. God was doing to his family what he said he would do. So then what are the principles we can learn from all of this? How do we take this? Because, again, it's, this is a hard passage to read. Like, why does the author put this in here? He didn't have to go into these, this level of detail. He didn't have to go into this. And again, so he's not doing this to be salacious, but he's trying to get us to see how awful and destructive sin is. put them all up there at once just for the sake of time but the first one is that that God is faithful now often when we hear that we think only the good things of God right so God is faithful he's blessing us he's he's showing us his his good mercies but God is also faithful in carrying out justice that he promises he as we said a couple weeks ago, last time I spoke, he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. And this chapter shows us exactly how God is using the actions of David's family to fulfill the punishment predicted in chapter 12. So we can learn like, that God is faithful. We also learn that the effects of sin can be devastating and lingering. Who would have imagined the ripple effect of their sin, of sin like this? How do our actions or inactions impact the lives of people around us? You know, just this one chapter covers a five-year span. And, and it's certainly not over yet. Rarely are the consequences of our sin over and done with quickly. They will affect our 
children, our wives, our husbands. And sometimes that pattern of sin is just hard to get out of. The other thing is that others are watching. David's kids saw how he acted. They saw his behavior with Bathsheba. You might think that your sin is behind closed doors or that it's victimless. But people see it. People see you. And whether or not you know it or like it, your actions influence how other people live. People might look at you like, look, they, they did it. They got away with it. Or they did it. It must not be that bad. Or, I don't know, maybe it's, I can probably hide things. I can cover it up. You know, certainly we as parents are aware of this. Probably not as much as we should be aware of it. But it's true just even with us as peers. We, we see each other. And we watch, and somehow that shapes the way that we think about how we interact and deal with God. So another thing I've already said, that we should surround ourselves with good friends. Don't have friends like Jonadab who will move you towards sin. Have friends like Joseph. You remember him from Genesis? He was a person who ran away from evil. You want friends who are going to encourage you to do the right thing, even if it costs you something. If you want to stop taking drugs or drinking or doing anything else, don't hang out with people who do. If you want to stop spending or overeating, leave your shopaholic friends and binge eaters behind. You know, what does Proverbs say about friends and character? Like saying, don't lose your voice. And I think this is a big one, especially for any of us who are, have grown in the faith for any length of time, or maybe for those of us who have made mistakes when we were younger. We've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. That does not mean, and Greg talked about this quite a bit last week, that does not mean that we should lose our voice and not tell people about the potential downfalls of their behavior. You know, you should still tell your kids to keep their hands off their boyfriends or girlfriends, even if you've slept with your boyfriend or girlfriend in college. It's not right. And just because you made that mistake doesn't mean that's a mistake that they need to make too. That's not being a hypocrite. That's being wise to help others avoid the same mistakes because those things are wrong. And that's true in every area of our life. Don't lose your voice. And this last one, I don't know, I'm being a little snarky with this one, but put on your big boy or your big girl pants. Doing the right thing is hard. It is. In every area of your life, it's hard. Saying the right thing, doing the right thing, taking control of your emotions, hard, hard, hard. And it's ten times harder under the weight of sin. And if I may paraphrase a line from The Princess Bride, life is hard. They say pain in the movie, but life is hard. 
And anyone who says differently is selling something. And they're probably selling a self-help book or some kind of medication to help you cope. But either way, we need to be people who will put on our big boy and our big girl pants and trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Father, we come before you today as people who have all been scarred by sin. Not a single one of us. And yet somehow in your grace and in your mercy, you've protected us. You've kept us alive. Yet, we still have to deal with our consequences. And so God, help us as we go forward from this day on to see the devastating, perverse, and paralyzing nature of sin. And help us to run from it, to flee it. And to live lives that are for you in obedience and trusting and faith in you. So, Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus.